Today I'm going to talk on this theme of transformation about clinical trials and why is it uh, that we need, to, uh, we need to do them. So my job really as a, as a clinical researcher is to help you make the choice about whether you should take the red pill or the blue pill. And to really understand whether you take the red, blue pill or the blue, the red pill or the blue pill, uh, we need to do clinical trials. And if we haven't done that, all I'm offering you really is snake oil, which is fairly freely available here in Vietnam. So. Uh, when we're doing clinical trials, what we're interested in doing is measuring the benefits of those drugs and comparing them with the harms. And of course, what we want is our benefits to significantly outweigh the harms. And we do that on a background of understanding the disease that we're working in and the severity of that disease. So I work mainly in brain infections, and these have very poor outcomes. The disease I focus on has a death rate of about 50% six months after diagnosis and a 100% death rate without treatment. So. Why do we need to do trials? We need to do trials because biological systems are incredibly complicated. So here uh, I've got the example of cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the disease that leads to heart attacks where the blood supply is cut off to part of the heart and part of the heart dies or to strokes where the blood supply is somehow interrupted to part of the brain and part of the brain dies resulting in paralysis. There's many factors that influence each of our risk of having cardiovascular disease. And I've put some of them up here. So things like what we're familiar with. Are you a smoker? Are you overweight? How much exercise do you do? But in addition, things like what other diseases do I have? Diabetes, high blood pressure, even any disease that seems to cause inflammation can increase our risk of having heart attacks. And alongside that, there's our social background. How rich are we? How poor are we? What's our job? What's our family history? What's our genetic makeup? In addition to all these things that we know about have some kind of influence, there's uh, these unknown factors in the yellow there. So we don't understand everything about our diseases. And what this really means for us as individuals is that we're all going to have unique natural histories of disease. None of us are exactly the same. We're all going to respond slightly differently when we have an illness. So here's another example. This is about the natural history of HIV, which is something that I work on. Uh, HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, infects the cells of our immune system. Uh, and uh, over time, it particularly causes a fall by killing uh, the, num the, the number of CD4 cells that we have in our body. And we can measure these cells in our blood with a simple blood test. And the CD4 cells are the cells that really coordinate our immune system when it fights infections, but also when it protects us against other diseases like cancer, for example. And over time, after you've been infected with HIV, the CD4 count falls. And what happens as it falls is that you become at increased risk of uh, infections and even cancers as well. And you can see two patients here, Mr. or Mrs. Red and Mr. or Mrs. Green. And over time, their CD4 counts fall. Uh, and eventually, their CD4 counts reach a level where they're really getting uh, serious infections and infections uh, and illnesses due to organisms that don't normally make us ill at all. So you can see that Mr. Mr. Green here uh, has had four serious infections in a four-year period here, and his CD4 count fell somewhat more rapidly than Mr. Red, uh, who's had just one serious infection in the same time period. So imagine I came up with a drug in my, uh, in my laboratory, and we thought this would be great. This is really going to sort out HIV. I could test that by inviting Mr. Red to my clinic uh, and saying, look, I've got this great drug. Tra take this and tell me how you get on. And I could follow him up for three years, and he'd be fine. No serious illnesses. We think, what a brilliant drug. But actually, of course, that was just the natural history of his disease. I can't just give a treatment to a patient and see how they do on it. If I'd given the drug to Mr. Green, for example, uh, and followed him up, he might have had two or three serious infections in that same time period. The drug might even have reduced the number of infections that he had. Remember, here's his natural history. Uh, and he had four serious infections. And in my trial, maybe he only has three. And I'd come away thinking, well, that treatment's no good. He still had two or three serious infections while he was on it. What I'm getting at is that we need to compare our treatments really rigorously. And to do that, we need something called controls. A control is a patient who gets the best possible care we can give them, but they don't get our new intervention. Uh, and we compare them with patients who get the best possible treatment we've got and our novel treatment. So here's a controlled experiment. I've got two, two, uh, two patients. On the right, I'm going to give the patient uh, my standard of care treatment. And on the left, I'm going to give my patient uh, my novel drug. And of course, we've still got a problem here. 
Because I don't know if they're Mr. Red or Mr. Green when we start. I don't know what their natural history is. I can't look into the future. And it might be that I end up giving my standard treatment again to Mr. Red, and he's just going to be pretty well anyway, because that's just the natural history of his disease. And I give my new treatment to Mr. Green, and even if it helps him, he has more infections than Mr. Red in that time period. And therefore, I'm going to end up thinking that my treatment is no good, whereas in fact there is a benefit. It's no good testing my treatment in just a couple of patients. In fact, if we look at the HIV population, it's like this. There's all these patients, and they've all got different natural histories of disease, different declines in their CD4 counts. Many of them might maybe like Mr. Red, many like Mr. Green. In fact, I've probably got a Mr. Purple, a Mr. Brown, a Mr. White, a Mr. Black, all, many different colors, lots of people with different rates of decline and different risks of getting ill over that time period. And as I said before, I just can't tell who they are. I can't tell how they're going to perform when I first meet them. I can't tell what their natural history will be. So how do we get around that in clinical trials? Well, here's our HIV population again, okay? And I've kept it very simple. We've got Mr. Reds and Mr. Greens, and we've got the same numbers of Reds, Mr. Reds as Mr. Greens, 50-50 in our HIV population. And I'm gonna do a trial with my new treatment. And, they, and some of these patients, not all of them, but some of them come to my hospital for treatment. When they come to our hospital, we invite them to come into our trial. And everybody with a circle around them has come into our trial. And if you've got a, a yellow circle around you, you're going to get a standard of care treatment. And if you've got a blue circle around you, you're going to get our novel treatment. Now, the thing is, I don't decide. I don't make that decision about whether you get the standard of care or the new treatment. We use something called randomization to make that decision. And randomization can be very simple. It could be the flip of a coin. If it lands on one side, you're given one treatment. If it lands on the other, you're given the other treatment. But usually, in practice, we use a computer program to allocate treatment to our patients when they come. And the beauty of randomization is this. I've chosen 48 out of these 100 patients, and I randomly assign, I genuinely randomly assign them their treatments. And I can make a table and look at all our patients who are getting our standard treatment, and I can add up the number of green patients, Mr. Greens, and the number of Mr. Reds. And I've got 13 Mr. Greens and 11 Mr. Reds. And if I look in our new treatment, our novel treatment, I've got 11 Mr. Greens and 13 Mr. Reds. So they're about 50-50. They're not perfectly 50-50, even though our population was perfectly 50-50, but they're about as close to 50-50 as you could get. So that's great. I've got really nicely balanced groups. I've not got all the Reds in one, one group who are going to do uh, well and all the Greens in the other group who are going to do badly. And moreover, this population actually represents, is very similar to my HIV population. Half of them are red and half of them are green in each treatment arm. And that's an effect, that's what randomization does for you. It protects you. It allocates your treatment at the right rate to the right numbers of patients in your population. So here's an example. This is a trial of antibiotic therapy that we used uh, for cryptococcal meningitis. Now, uh, cryptococcus is a yeast, and here it is. This is a photo of it from our lab. It's very beautiful, but it's a killer. Death rate's 100% without treatment. It's about 50% on treatment after six months. And we enrolled 300 patients, and this was the biggest ever study in this, uh, in this disease in a single site. And we randomized them to one of three treatments. We randomized them to the standard of care that we had in Vietnam, the best treatment that, could be a, that was being given in Vietnam at, Vietnam at the time that had a death rate of about 50% and we uh, randomized them to a treatment combination one, which was what everybody thought was the best treatment, but had never been shown to stop people, uh, excess people dying from this disease. And, we, but, and, and the disadvantage of that treatment was really expensive. And the last group, sorry, we randomized to a novel combination of, a of antibiotics, which is somewhat cheaper uh, than that middle, that middle treatment there. And here's the results. So, uh, a little bit of technical information. This is called a survival curve. What we have here is time at the bottom, days going along up to six months, and up the side we've got the chance of being alive. And each of these curves is our different uh, experimental arm from our trial. So in the, in the black curve is the people who got the standard treatment, what was being given at the time in Vietnam and most places around the world. In the middle is our novel treatment combination, and at the top is our treatment combination number one. And, at the, and this is your chance of being alive at any particular time point. So at the beginning of the trial, the chance of being alive is one, or 100%, if you like, because we don't enroll dead patients into trials. 
So everybody's alive at the beginning. As time goes on, people start to die, and the chance of being alive falls. And you can see it's falling at different rates uh, in the different treatment arms. And we can compare the risk of being dead at particular time points, and we can work out which of our treatments is saving patients' lives. And it looks clear from this that this is probably the best treatment, but we need to do some statistical tests to be sure that that is a genuine effect, and that might not just have occurred by chance. If you throw six dice enough times, you'll get six sixes. Chance plays an effect in clinical trials as well. And what we do is we generate a statistic that tells us what is the likelihood we would have seen this difference in survival if actually, the, if actually our drug didn't do any good. And if that difference would occur less than 5% of the time uh, by chance, then we say, well, actually, we'll say the drug did that. So looking at our treatments, we got that 5% or less than 4% here, or 0.04, for the comparison of this treatment with this treatment. But we couldn't show any difference between this treatment and this treatment, or this treatment and this treatment. This difference wasn't just, just wasn't big enough to look like it might have been due to anything other than chance. So the treatment combination one seems better than the standard of care treatment, uh, but it didn't seem to be better than our, uh, our novel treatment, didn't seem to be better uh, than, our, than our combination treatment. We couldn't really see a difference there. And we then need to ask ourselves the question, well, are our groups really the same? How I started this talk, have we got the same numbers of reds and greens, if you like, in each of our treatment groups? And we can look at that basic information. So this is the, when the patient's presented, we've presented in the table form all of their information, how many of them were, what their age was, how many were men, how many were drug users. And that information is all quite nicely balanced until we get here to something called the Glasgow Coma Score. Now, that's a way of measuring whether someone's fully conscious or got some degree of unconsciousness when they come into hospital. And being unconscious is bad for you in general. It's a bad prognostic sign. And we can see that in the first two treatment arms, about 68% of patients were fully conscious. But in our last novel treatment arm, 80% uh, of patients were fully conscious. So you've got to think, well, are they exactly the same? Or were they a bit less sick in that arm? And we have a bit more information here, looking at we, call, we can measure the amount of that yeast that's causing the disease in the cerebrospinal fluid around their brain. And that was lower in our patients in our novel treatment arm. So why have we got this imbalance? Because this is a randomized controlled trial. We weren't choosing what treatment we gave. We were just randomly assigning treatment to patients when they came into our hospital. It's chance. It just happens occasionally. The bigger your population group, the, the lower the risk that you'll get a bit of imbalance due to chance. The second question is, does this, does this difference that we're seeing in our patients, does it matter? We can use something called Cox regression. It doesn't really matter the name, except that this is Sir David Cox. I'm sure he thinks it matters. Very bright man uh, who, who invented this method of analysis. And what we can do is we can put all those baseline factors or a number of them that we think are important into our model, into that survival analysis, and we can say which of these different things seems to independently increase the risk of dying. And we found that, sure enough, the baseline fungal count and the Glasgow Coma score, how unconscious you were, do independently affect your chance of, uh, of um, dying. And we can then take that information back into this survival analysis and say, all things being equal, now what's the effect of our treatment? And what we found was that actually that treatment combination one was better than our standard treatment. And when we adjust for those differences in illness severity between those patients that appear to be there, it also looks like it's better than the novel combination treatment as well. So uh, in summary, uh, we transform medical care through clinical trials. And because biological systems are so complex, we need to use controls when we do this. And we need to use randomization, which makes sure that we don't have uh, it really reduces the risk of us having those kinds of imbalances uh, within our trial arms, but we can't completely eradicate that risk, but we have strategies for dealing with it. And the last thing I'll just leave you with is to consider, is it ethical to use untested treatments? Should I be prescribing a treatment that I've never tested, or should we only prescribe treatments that have been tested? Because there's lots of treatment out there in the world uh, outside conventional medicine that has not been tested. And thanks for your attention.